Good evening. Welcome to Christian Conversation. July 5th, 2022. What an awesome opportunity we have tonight to come together and have a just a normal Christian conversation about a challenging subject. Um, one, one that just feels like it's right. Um, so I, I want to welcome you to our studio. Uh, I'm Miles Karchard. I'm founder of R3 Ministries, and uh, we have a lot of stuff going on tonight, but we want to just throw a few things at you. First of all, I want to talk about my hatchet. Now, some of you can see, um, I bought this hatchet in this condition, uh, which is extremely rare. I'm showing it to you because I have a newfound hobby that was I caught the disease from a pastor friend of mine, David Austin from uh, Pea Ridge, Arkansas. And David has a, uh, an addiction to axes. And so he and I have done a little bit of trading uh, between hatchets and hatchets and axes. But I just want to, I'm going to keep this around for a while. And I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Um, this one is polished. I mean, when I say polished, I mean like razor polished. Um, you get this fine edge with 3,000 grit sandpaper with water. This is like heavy duty razor sharp. But we're going to make a display of a large number of hatchets. When I say a large number, that number is dependent on whether you will help us or not. If you happen to have an old hatchet laying around, uh, or an axe, um, if it happens to have any writing on it, now this is a true-tempered, flint-edge, octagon shape handled hatchet in incredibly great shape. This is an old hatchet. So I'm just going to remind you frequently that if you have any laying around the old barnyard, or if you go in an antique store and you say, you know, I just want to, I thought about Miles, I'm going to just, pick this up and call him and send it to him. We're going to make a beautiful display uh, that I think a lot of you are going to enjoy when it's finished. But we're going to have to have more than just a few. We want multiple numbers. So tonight we are going to uh, also, at the end of the show, we're going to pray for our friend David and Julie who are in South America. Now, many of you know I went to South America last year and... Um, it was just an incredible opportunity to, um, to go and minister in the jungle and see miracles and see healings and see deliverance and see salvation. And um, So they're there doing some uh, leadership work, and then they're going to take a few days of much-needed time of, as, for their anniversary. So we want to be praying for David and Julie and First Love Ministries at the end of the show. Um, we, we wanted to invite them on tonight, but they're doing some teaching there in uh, Lima, Peru, and uh, so they were unable to join us. But tonight, I have uh, my right-hand son, uh, friend, uh, couldn't do without Justin, who's in the studio with me. He's on the other side of the wall, but thanks to technology, uh, Justin will throw himself up there on the screen in a few minutes. But we're going to be talking about something that we believe is extremely relevant. And that is, how do you deal with blended families? And the take we're going to take is, why is it so difficult for the church to instruct us on how to deal with divorce, remarrying, blended kids, bringing them in together, and then what do we do with them? Because the church, as we know it, has an opposition to divorce, but yet it happens in 53% of the marriages in America. Got some interesting statistics for you that we're going to share. So, Justin, if you will show up right about now, if you would, um, somewhere on the screen. You're going to be there in a minute. I know you are. The graphic behind us shows family, and it shows there he is. Hey, buddy, on hey, the everybody. other side of the wall. Um, so, Justin is a, a father of... Two teenagers. Yeah, scary. Oh, Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, one of your children lives with you. Yes, sir. Which is a 16-year-old son. Yeah. 
which presents its own set of issues. And then you have a 14-year-old daughter who yeah. lives with her mother, yeah. um, who is a part of a second blended family. Yeah. So um, it sounds like a recipe for some stuff. Yeah. In fact, maybe some of this stuff, <laughs> maybe some hatchet work. But I, I just Googled a couple of things, and Justin, I want to thank you for being willing to um, sure to sort of open up your own can of worms, for lack of a better term. But um, most of us remember uh, the Brady Bunch. Um, and the Brady Bunch was a blended family that ended up with a bunch of kids. Um, and um, I, I think that we have to realize that the church has failed to be willing to deal with difficult subject matters. Would you agree with that, Justin? I would, and I don't want anybody to feel like it's they're being called out. It's it's difficult to deal with difficult things. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I, I'm looking at a statistic here. It says 30 percent of marriages in the United States. This this was in 1966, by the way. 30 percent of the marriages in the United States of America have a child or children from a previous marriage. Now, that was in 1966. Now, that, that number has changed dramatically. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's, there's 1,300 new step families formed every day in America. I believe it. There are one out of two marriages end in divorce in America. Yeah. 50% uh, of the families are renamed, or excuse me, are remarried or recoupled. Yeah. And that's in the church as well as in the world. It doesn't. There's no difference. In fact, Justin, yeah, the latest statistics say that the divorce rate is higher in the church than it is in the secular because the secular not everybody's getting married. They're just they're cohabitating. But 75 percent of the people remarry after their first marriage. Yeah. So these are alarming statistics that bring children to the table. Um, so I'm not going to ask you um, to tell us about your challenges. I'm going to ask you to take a, per, a, a perspective view of, do you feel like the church was a source of guidance for you hmm. going through this process? Wow. Um, and I hope you can hear me. I can't. Uh, we are... A wall apart, but we have no direct <laughs> communication. We're pretty um, close right now. <laughs> yeah. So, was the church a help? So, I have to answer that with a yes, of course, because, you know, we always have uh, folks in church around us that, you know, are friends that have our best interest in mind. Um, was everybody at the church, everybody in my leadership team, you know, helpful to me? Probably not. Um, just being honest, I think everybody was conscious of what was going on with me in my life. I'm trying to be fair and, you know, correct on this stuff. Um, but everybody sort of has their own agenda of how they can help or how they perceive things need to go in my life and in the people that we're helping's life. I hope that makes sense. Um, the other thing that's incredibly difficult to deal with is fault or blame and the human nature element of how do we deal with the things that this person did and the, per the things that this person did and sort of meet in the middle. And if people aren't willing to meet together that makes it that much more difficult. So when you've got a divorce situation, and I spoke about this at my church recently uh, when we covered some of these topics, um, when you're dealing with divorce and people are not willing to say, I'm wrong, let's fix it, uh, it, it gets very difficult. So one of the statistics here, Justin, says there's 60 million children under the age of 13 in America. 50% of those 60 million, which is 30 million, are living with one biological parent 
and the parent's other partner, whether it be married or cohabitating or whatever. Yeah. So 42%, 42 million adults in the United States have been married more than one time, and that number is up 22 million since 1980. Wow. So I want to I want to go back because I you know obviously I've been a pastor and just let let me just put my stuff out there. I have been divorced. Um, I have I had a, a wife and three children. Um, I divorced when my children were grown. Um, I was the at fault partner. Um, so you can judge me, but I'm just being transparent because I think transparency is going to help us deal with this more than anything else. Yeah, but that's dude. Yeah. One of the biggest issues that we have that I had in my family was that children are f- taught to feel like they have to choose between the two. And there's some statistics that I'm going to get into here in a minute that are even lead me stronger to believe that the church is not prepared or equipped to deal with the inevitable that 50 plus percent of the people in the church are going to end up divorced. In fact, many pastors are ending up in divorce. Yeah. Um, many youth pastors are ending up in divorce. Many worship leaders are ending up in divorce. 40% of new marriages in 2013 <laughs> included at one at least one of the persons had been married before. Yeah. I think it's just a fact of where we are in society. Uh, should the church be doing better? Probably. Uh, I think we've got a great example uh, in front of us. But, you know, here I am sitting a divorced worship leader, pastor at a church uh, here locally. And, you know, I'm remarried to a wonderful woman who has... You know, two kids in a in a blended family. So I have, I have two stepsons. <laughs> I have my yeah, my wonderful mother in law who lives with us, and we have a. So my my son is with us. Uh, so he's living with a stepmom. My daughter is living with her biological mother. Step dad, step sister, and I mean it's just complicated. And I think. That's just where we are. I think it has to just be okay. And so, so, so the difficulties, a, I think, come in, you know, for how do you minister to that group? Um, it's difficult. It's difficult because the natural structure that maybe God showed us with a husband and a wife and all of that um, is still there. But there's pieces off in the distance that we don't have the same ministry uh, influence over. And I think one of the things you spoke to a second ago about um, families being together and in one place definitely presents itself with some ministry challenges. Well, so... I want to I want to keep going back to because I think this is the the main focus of this conversation tonight, and that is this. I, I look at this website I'm looking at, and it's called rawhide.org. You can look it up if you want to. Uh, has a tremendous <laughs> amount of statistics and how you deal with these kids and how you and it just the the information is you know age groups and how they adjust to blended families, which one suffers the most. Ten helpful ideas, establishing a relationship with an ex-spouse and a blend of just the list goes on and on and on. But I, I struggle, Justin, with the fact that we still believe that the church is not the place for divorce and blended families. But in reality, that divorced family and that blended family needs a church more than anybody else probably. Absolutely. If, if, if you go, and I went to another website, and, you know, I just, that's why I got all this stuff up here. But I, go, I Googled Bible verses parenting. And I just want to tell you that there's no Bible verses about blended families. I just, they ain't in there. 
Right. But I just want to share a couple of scriptures with you. And Justin will put these up maybe. Um, we all know this one, Proverbs 22, 6. No, you're not going to put them on there. You didn't give them to me. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way you sh they should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> there's a lot of people that don't understand the validity of that message because many families have brought their children up in the right way and they've gone out into the pasture somewhere and they haven't returned yet. Yeah. Um, not everybody's like Justin, and I brag on Justin because Justin never took the low road. He always took the high road most of the time. Um, but listen to some of these scriptures. Whosoever spares the rod hates their children. Wow. That is strong language. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. That's Proverbs 13, 24. Listen to this one. Proverbs 29, 15. A rod and a reprimand impart wisdom. But a child left undisciplined disgraces his mother. Doesn't say his father, his mother. So, just a little um, um, disclaimer here. I grew up in a family that my daddy would beat you with a stick almost hmm. over the least little thing. I never heard my mother and father have a discussion that sounded argumentative. I never heard my mother back talk my dad. I never heard anybody in my family back talk my dad or mother. Um, we did not do the things we were supposed to do, but we did not conduct ourselves in an unparented way in the house because you'd have had a head taken off. But my father believed that discipline was a change mechanism. And discipline does not change anybody. It only gives you consequences for the decision that you made. I got disciplined because I made bad choices. Now, again, from transparency, I do not remember ever spanking one of my children. Mm. Never. And I came from a family that we were all disciplined, but I never spanked one of my children. Now, I'm sure their mother did, but I didn't ever do that because... I had such a, a traumatized thought process about discipline in the house. Listen to this scripture. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Now, that could go... I mean, that's a big, big, big screen right there. Yeah. Um, I had to ask Justin what that word meant, exasperate. And he actually gave me a scholarly answer um, but you know I guess we can put more on our kids from a d discipline perspective than than they can handle and I think Justin uh, it's uh, we, we don't want to talk about anybody in particular but in a recent illustration we saw where some of our opinions was a little bit too heavy for moving forward it was like yeah it, it well I'm okay to talk about that briefly, and maybe it'll help someone else who may hear this. Um, so, sorry, I'm trying to check some levels in here, too. Um, so, we were dealing with some behavioral issues and choices with my son. Um, and it's, you know, nothing that a lot of other people haven't dealt with. You know, just constant, you know, cultural uh, things that a lot of teenagers make decisions to do, you know, just some average disrespect, you know, I'm going to do my thing, a little bit of, you know, strong headedness uh, that a lot of us guys deal with when we get to that age, you know, 15, 16, 17 Did years you old. Do that? We think we got stuff figured out or we're trying to figure it out, but we want to have it all sort of puffed up on our shoulders and, um, you know, our household is not immune to that. Um, and, you know, my human, you know, 
I'm the dad, I'm the big guy response to my son is, well, it's my house, my rules, man. So, you know, if you don't like it, and, you know, I got to be honest with you, I, I took everything out of his room, I grounded him 100%, and, you know, I turned my house effectively into a jail cell, and, you know, put him under a very heavy load. Exasperating. Yeah, and to a point, and, and it was also completely heavy on my family, so my my wife's relationship my and my son's relationship. Um, Mine and his relationship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it go, it goes outside of my house sure. into my extended family. And um, and then, you know, he's sort of in a situation where, you know, him and his biological mother, who are, you know, 600 miles away, um, we're put in a situation where we're trying to co-parent children in two different houses. And that relationship gets, you know, stretched a bit in some ways. And um, we got to that point, you know, because I felt like, and I finally had to just admit to one, you, uh, you know, my my stepdad, my wife, um, and to my son that, you know what, we're kind of in a bad situation. And me continuing to make it worse isn't going to help. And so parents... Admit when you're wrong. Your, my heart was in the right place. I felt like I needed to put structure and put, you know, some discipline, I think is the word. Um, but I've also learned something through this process that, you know, when, when somebody goes to the army, they're given tons of discipline, but it's not always negative. We have to stop looking at discipline as always being the negative response to something. You can have very positive disciplines in your life. And so what we're trying to do in our house, as much as we're learning through this whole process, is we're trying to set up positive disciplines so that we don't have to always have discipline in a negative way. So we're talking about everything having to do with responsibility accountability and integrity and those are the three big words in my house now do we always get it right no absolutely not um, but we're trying to shift into more of doing things in love doing things because they have a purpose not just so that I can be the big dad on the block and that sort of you know I can admit this and we've had numbers of conversations about this um, you and I and my wife and I and our family and you know this is just one family's input and every family in definitely America and probably across the world are dealing with very similar things um, but if you if you don't have Christ in the center of that relationship it doesn't matter how much respect you think you've got uh, between you if you can't look at your son or your daughter um, and see Christ in them, first and foremost, nothing else is going to matter. So we have had to go back and sort of relearn where we are, uh, because until we know where we are, we can't move forward. Until we learn who we are, we can't move forward into who we're going to be. And so we're sort of in a little bit of a relearning season uh, in our house, coming off the back of that exasperation season where, you know, discipline kind of had to learn how it needed to work in our house and we're restructuring again we may restructure in the future and um, <laughs> yeah. that's so, sort so, of so listen to this scripture a loop yeah no discipline seems pleasant at the time but Amen. painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those has those who have been trained by it, Hebrews twelve eleven. Let me read that again. Yeah. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. We all could say amen to that, for the child and the parent. But it's painful. Later, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Trained by what? Trained by discipline. 
Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become very discouraged. And I think that's what we were experiencing with Elijah. I think that my, even me, I, I'm just going to put me at the top of the house because I'm the granddad, I'm the father in the house, so I'm the head of the house. And I was pushing you, pushing you, you need to do this, you need to do this, I do this, if it, you know, and it's like, so you're following my advice, and it was horrendous. I mean, it was not good advice because it was not based on a father's love. It was based on a father's experience. Listen to this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Take no thought of tomorrow. It will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's the truth. So, um, and, and I, we haven't done this in a year and a half. We haven't gone over our time allotment. But tonight I'm going <laughs> to forewarn everybody that's got your 8.30 clock set. We're going to keep talking for a few minutes. And if we go over and you want to cut it off, that's okay. You can come back and watch it later. Justin, listen to this statistic. Yeah. Counseling blended family issues. Listen to this. Two families plus different parenting styles plus new family routines equals huge challenge. Yeah, let me speak to that for a second because, um, you know, if you're not in a blended family, you don't understand this. I mean, when you have a child, you bring that child into the earth or you adopt that child and you raise them up and you set the culture for your house and that child is raised up in that same culture, everything works really well. You, you, because the child has seen the way you are from the time they're born to the time that, you know, they're an adult. They're like, I know dad, I expect this from him, I know what to do. Well, for a lot of us, we, when our children get somewhere, for me, it was, I think my kids were five and seven or six and eight, somewhere in that range. I got divorced. So they don't have an understanding of culture for what dad looks like with my mom at 16. All that went out the window. And so then you bring another spouse into the family that they don't know. And you expect things to go back to the way you think that culture was supposed to be by this point. Well, all that went out the window when they were six. Then you had a period of time that everything was chaotic. You know, single parent here, single parent here, trying to co-parent together in separate houses. Then you bring another spouse in. Well, that spouse creates an entirely new culture. So everybody has to learn the new culture again from, from start. So we go back to infancy in our culture and then as this thing blooms into something new you've got the other parent so maybe this parent didn't remarry as quickly so I'm just gonna go with he is still single parenting the children the children have a stepdad on this side well they're developing culture over here but this guy's still sort of stuck in that rut of I don't know what life looks like there may be bitterness present there may be I'm feeling rejected because my now ex-wife is remarried and they're happy and I'm over here miserable. Um, maybe they're blaming this thing. And so you've got a really chaotic situation. And culture can't bloom inside of chaos. It just doesn't happen. Uh, finally, well, that was pretty you deep know, right there. Do what? That was pretty deep right there. Thanks. Culture cannot bloom in chaos. Thanks. Um, so You can tweet that one. Yeah. <laughs> to continue the story, maybe uh, the dad over here finally gets remarried, but then culture has to start completely again from infancy. And that's from, you know, maybe the new husband and the new wife over here um, have been dating each other according, getting to know each other, and they kind of keep the kids off to the side because you never know how that dating relationship is going to work as you begin to start something new you're beginning to start culture over here but your kids are sort of still in that chaos in the middle 
bring things to a good point. Both couples are now remarried. This people over here have had a, a year or two to start from infancy again, birthing that culture. These people are at infancy, so you've got a two-year-old relationship and an infant culture over here. So they're going to grow at different relationship levels. Things are going to mature at different levels. Maybe by the time the kids are 20 or 25, they've figured out what life looks like again, as opposed to this you know, natural family over here that followed the traditional standard. Their parents stuck it out. Um, you know, These kids are 25 and decently well adjusted, we hope. And these two blended families have had to start over two or three times. And so, it's very, very difficult. I hope that sort of puts it into perspective. So, so let me, I hope this is okay. If it's not, just cut my mic off. Um, so your son yeah. is actually not your biological son. He is adopted. That's correct. You adopted him. I did. Because you married his mother when he was a child. Yeah, I adopted my... Well, I have been in his life since before he was a year old. So okay. but he has a known life without me. So he's still potentially dealing with some genetic, hereditary uh, DNA issues that maybe you don't have a clue where that came from. Let me... Hmm. Let me, let me uh, I, don't, I, want, I want to talk about it in another perspective. I just want to throw that out there. I know a young man whose mother was married four times and she lived cohabitated with two men. Her two children had different parents, but each one of them had five different father figures before they were 16 years old. Yeah, that's tough. But you look at these kids and you think, that has to be a social train wreck. Yeah. Both of those kids have excelled in life. Both of them have excelled in life. And now, unfortunately, their mother just died at 55 years old. Mm. So not only have they had five or six father figures, now they got no mother figure. And it's like, how in the world, so I want to go back to my original question. Is the church prepared to deal with this type of stuff? Listen to this, listen to this. We all know that, we, we all know that the Brady Bunch was a blended family. Without a maid, <laughs> the Brady Bunch was a complete fictitious story. But even the Brady Bunch was not perfect. Carol found a pack of cigarettes in Greg's jacket in season two. And even though the cigarettes were obviously not his, kids at every age level in the Brady Bunch had to figure out how to deal with one another in that crisis with those cigarettes. And that, that, that's just a fictitious story. But Justin, that is such a real issue. Yeah. When your daughter or my daughter sees her brother or her sister doing something that there's no repercussions or no discipline for, then it, it's, it's okay to do it. It's like, it's not a problem. And so the church, I'm so concerned, and this is just one issue. This is just one issue. Um, how, about, how about this issue? Yeah. How about this one? So you have a mother with two children. One of the children are closer to the mother than the other one. So the mother feels like, after divorce or after death or whatever, I can tell Johnny anything and he will not judge me. But I can't tell Jackson everything or anything because he was so close to his dad that it's like, yeah. boom. Yeah. So there, there's another issue, and again, I just have a fear that the church is not prepared to deal with the continued skewing numbers that this crisis is going to become greater and greater and greater because it's now socially accepted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Deep subject, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's difficult. There's no easy answers to this. I, I think 
you know, as our ministry is set up to minister to pastors, you know, and this conversation uh, was structured as a way to hopefully benefit pastors, you know, church people, Christians in general, um, that something in this, encur we do find some encouragement for those folks. Um, you know, going back to your, to your base question, is the church prepared? No. But is anybody prepared? Um, you know, nobody goes into a relationship expecting it to fail. Um, even though there's a song that comes to my mind by Brad Paisley. It said, if love was a plane, nobody would get on because there's a 6 in 10 chance that we're going to hit the ground. Uh, so nobody goes into a relationship expecting it you know, to fail. We always have the best of intentions. Um, you know, but people are selfish. So, people so I wanna, are I wanna, I a wanna mess. Close with the, yeah. I want to close with a um, a real life story that happened in my life when I was an associate pastor in 1977 in a Pentecostal Holiness Church in rural America. Mm -hmm. um, we were, I would go up on Saturday morning and spend the day visiting, spend the night in a camper and be there all day Sunday. And on Saturday night, we got a call from one of the elders in the church and it was just like, you could tell that there was fear, terror, anger, screaming, hollering, call the police, whatever. It was just out of, they called the parsons and wanted the pastor to come over there. So he gets me up out of the camp and says, let's go over here and let's go deal with this crisis. So we go to this house at 2 o'clock in the morning of one of the elders in the church, in a Pentecostal holiness church, and they had caught their 13-year-old daughter making out with another girl at a sleepover. The dad was going to kill the other girl or his wife, one, and the little girl was petrified, and the other little girl who did not go to church at all was like in the corner in the fetal position thinking that she was getting ready to get her head chopped off. Wow. And this, and the reason I'm telling this story is I remember the pastor making this statement to me. We are not equipped to deal with this situation. We're not prepared to deal with this situation. Because you got to deal with anger. you got to deal with judgment. you got to deal with violence. you got to deal with profanity. you got to deal with frustration. you got to deal with... The husband's blaming the wife. The wife don't know what to say. The little girl don't know what to say. They get the other parents over there. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, it's like, what are we going to do? So we go to church on Sunday morning, and all of us that were in this house that night, we were like exasperated. If that's the right word. We were done. <laughs> and the two little girls, 13 years old, came up and ask Jesus into their heart and ask God to forgive them of their decision. Wow. Then, that Sunday night, the father came up and asked God to forgive him. That's great. It's a great story, but we were not prepared to deal with it. Yeah. So, we've gone over 10, 12 minutes. I make no apologies for it. Uh, we're not on a schedule. We're on our own time. It's our own studio. Right. Justin, thank you for being transparent. Uh, thank yeah. you for being honest. Um, well, let, let me say one more thing, um, sort of to wrap up a thought. I mean, so one of the biggest things that has ministered to me, you know, through this journey of, you know, marriage, divorce, remarrying, you know, blended family, raising teenagers, all of the struggles that go into that, one of the biggest things that has ministered to me, and so if you're a pastor out there, if you're a family who's dealing with this, is honestly coming to terms with the fact that, one, I'm not alone in this situation. Everybody else is having very similar problems. It's not just me. Statistics don't lie. Right. So take all of that. I have failed... I'm the only one on the planet who has 
made this giant mess and throw it out the window. Two, you're going to mess up. There's there's no rules on this thing. That's a the most question. important thing that we can do is keep our family loved, keep them covered in prayer, and keep them in church as best you can so that they're getting some of this positivity that I hope the churches are bringing. Being in the presence of God covers so much because having His grace applied to our life hopefully helps us in having grace between the people in our family. So when my son comes home and you know he's just a whole bottle of attitude and he's non-compliant and my first response is to say but I I'm in charge here. What are you, what's your argument? Yeah. Just do what I told you to do and hush. You know, that sort of mindset jumps on me. I have to remember that I was 16 and I did the same thing to my parents and they didn't kill me. Thank God. So slow down, have a little bit of God's grace flow out of me to cover him, to cover me. Let him cool off. Let me cool off. We're going to come back. We're going to chat. If there needs to be correction, we're going to talk about that. Um, but knowing that, one, I'm not alone in this situation, and two, God's big enough to cover all of this. You know, there's nothing new here on the planet. You know, Adam and Eve had problems with their kids, if you'll remember. One of them, I think, had his way with the other one. And uh, they were the first family in the book. So it goes pretty negatively from the first group of people. Uh, not to mention the parents in that situation got kicked out of their homeland for disobeying God. Um, so we screwed it up from the first group mentioned in the book. You're going to be okay. Keep God in the center of your family. Keep God's grace coming into and out of your life. Uh, actually, to bring this full circle back to Pastor David, um, one of the things he said this morning um, was about having God refreshed inside your heart and having Him flowing in and out of your life. So I'm just bringing back up Pastor David because I listened to his uh, devotion this morning from Peru, which was incredible. The birds were chirping, and it's just beautiful over there. Um, but that is, that's been the biggest takeaway, and I'm learning, and I don't have this figured out. Uh, I have had two or three people tell me that I should write a parenting book. Um, I don't know if I'm smart enough to do that. But, you know, I've been thinking uh, a lot about the journey um, from being sort of just a dumb kid that got married back when I was 24, 25, and... Um, where I'm at now in my early, early, early 40s. Um, you don't have to brag about the fact that you're in your early 40s. Hey, man. So, Justin, again, yeah. thank you for um, adding significant value to this conversation. Uh, I'm looking at my desk here. I've got a microphone. I've got a hatchet. Yeah. I've got a phone. I've got a Bible. I've got an iPad. I've got a notebook. I've got lights. I've got camera. And I still don't have all I need. So I want to suggest that we make sure that we understand that God's grace is sufficient. Amen. It is significant. It is sufficient. And He loves us no matter what we do or how many times we do it, how many times we mess up. He said, my grace is sufficient. He, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I do want to mention a couple of things in closing. David and Julie Austin are in Peru. Um, they are they they're pastors at Pea Ridge in uh, the Ridge in Pea Ridge, Arkansas. They're pe president and founder president of First Love Ministries. We're partners with them. We're partners with their church. They support us. We support them. Um, they are they are doing ministry. They came out of the rainforest yesterday. Um, alligator food. I mean, just you, you really just need to go to see it, but. Uh, we want to pray for them for safe travels. They're going to take a few days and relax in, Terrapo in Lima, which is awesome. They deserve it. Um, we want to pray for our prayer list. We have several people that are sick. Um, Willard McPherson has COVID.
pastor of Piney Forest uh, Baptist Church here in town. Um, want to want to be much in prayer for our friend Don and Ed. A nice wonder. Continue to pray for them. Great friends of ours. Just wonderful people. Want you to pray for Shepherd's Haven. We got a lot going on right now. We got a lot of great stuff going on, and we just need support. We need prayers. We need encouragement. We need visitors. We need a glass of water. Uh, come by and see us. Pat us on the back. If you can't do anything, just sit and talk to us. Uh, we got plenty of chairs. Um, but if you like this show, if you like Christian Conversation, if you like what we're trying to do, let us know. Share this video. Put it on your Facebook feed. Uh, send it out to somebody that you think might need it. Because, listen, we know what our ministry is. is to deal with pastors. This issue is not leaving pastors and parsonages outside. It's relevant to every single family that we know. Many, many pastors, their failure, when you go back and you dig deep enough, it came from some issues in the family early that created walls that made it impossible for them to overcome without the grace of God. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to talk about such a challenging, difficult subject. We need you to help us. We need you to teach us. We need you to guide us. We need you to forgive us. We need you to be patient with us. That God, we could somehow do something that would somebody could see hope in us as we turn them to you. Thank you so much for all your blessings, for all the new acquaintances that we met last week. Thank you for the opportunities that you introduced us to somebody from Santa Fe, New Mexico. You introduced us to somebody from Colorado, Denver, Colorado. You introduced us to people from different places around the world. God, thank you for the opportunity to be a voice in their lives for what's going on in the kingdom. We bless you. We honor you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Again, 8. 45 this time so um we just did it so uh, if you got any comments share them with us uh, if you don't like it keep it to yourself uh, we'll see you next tuesday at christian conversation at eight o'clock please download our app i think justin told me we have um a great number of downloads already in just a couple of weeks uh, we have 600 plus followers now on social media which is a big deal for us um, you can go to the apple store you can go to the Google Play Store. You can go to, um, you can pick up our webpage, www.r3ministriesinc.com. And uh, there's all of our contents on there. We would love to have you join us. And remember, if you have an old hatchet and you want to see somebody restore it into something brand new, give us a call. We'd love to have it. God bless you. Have a great week.